Hello everyone, welcome to Isra's vlog number 10. We've hit double figures, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah amazing think, that we've kept that it up. Um, today, there's only me and Tom here. Brown's not here. Uh, he's in Rome again, currently, so probably got a lot more sun than we've got here. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is the loudness war, or the loudness wars, mm. which is a, a, a term that's been coined for the over-compression and dynamic squashing of audio in recent years. Mm. Um, over the last sort of 10 years or so, it's just been gradually getting worse and worse, but we'll get on to that. And part of the reason why we're both wearing Metallica t-shirts, I don't know if you can see, um, but the album we're going to review, because this links very heavily with our topic, is Metallica's Death Magnetic, their last album. Um, because that is squashed to fuck. It's, 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 this is the biggest casualty of the uh, loudness wars so far. Yes. It's ridiculous. It has a dynamic range of three decibels, which we'll explain more about it later to people who don't know too much about it. But basically it's, uh, it's squashed to the point that it sounds awful, basically. Just, you can't listen to it. But yeah, so we're going to review that album after that glowing uh, summary. <laughs> um, after, <laughs> after we've talked a bit about, um, about the loudness wars and this whole uh, dynamic range issue that's affecting music. Yeah. Uh, it's quite a technical subject, actually, the loudness wars. Yeah, and we should start, let's start with a, with a basic summary to, exactly. um, of what it is. So if anyone out there doesn't actually know anything about it or they've heard heard the term before dynamic range or they've heard about the loudness war or over compression but they don't really know what it means we can kind of start with a, a quick explanation of it so do you want to do it or shall I? I'll do it so the first thing to understand is compression so uh, compression is a very important um, element of any mix uh, and basically it goes on multi multiple uh, in multiple stages in the mix um, and it's a very important element of mastering. So you have mixing, and then you have mastering that comes after the mixing, which is uh, effectively just, uh, well, tends to be making things louder um, nowadays. But uh, there's, it's basically bringing the songs into, into a, an actual album. But um, actually compression, what it is, is you have uh, a threshold in music. So let's say that you have uh, any given time in the music, um, uh, a certain point where above that range, which is the threshold, um, you have a compression ratio, let's say if it's two to one, anything above the threshold would be squashed down to 50% of its volume. Um, and then you have ratios that are going up and you go up to a ratio of 10 to one, which is what's called limiting. And that means that you're really squashing everything above a certain a certain level in the uh, in the dynamic range, everything above there you're squashing down uh, to 10% of its original volume. What this basically does is it it limits the dynamic range because there there isn't so much variation, and that gives you more loudness, effectively more perceived mm -hmm. loudness, so that the whole thing is louder and mm -hmm. more in your face. I think uh, that yeah, just the, the understanding of compression. So you got that. Um, Another thing, what happens is when, when effectively you've got the threshold and everything that's above there gets squashed down, you can then turn everything else, you can turn everything up a little bit, and then you do it again, you can turn it up a little bit more, and then everything that was down here that was, you know, a lower level of sound gets higher and higher, and uh, effectively you lose dynamic range, which is, you know, the kind of, um, how, you know, the difference between how loud soft and soft. loud it is, yeah. yeah. The, the dynamics, and... Uh, and the reason that this has really been um, such an issue recently is because in the industry, uh, and this is both in uh, music and in TV and broadcast and radio, mm. um, you have something called peak uh, normalization. What that means is that the, the peak level has to be a certain, a certain point. So this is where the audio peaks, the highest dynamic level. Um, not sure how technical we want to get, so let's go really so, well, quick quickly. So quickly on that, like if you're looking at peak levels, say you've got a song and it's it's volume sort of over here and it builds up and there's a louder point here and then it comes down. So that's your peak level. So that's the loudest level it would be broadcast through when it's um, when it's being broadcast on the radio. That level would be zero. So everything else would be pretty quiet, kind of 
comparatively. So if you have other tracks that have been limited a lot, so everything's at the maximum level all the time, then that track being broadcast on the same system by the same um, broadcaster will sound louder and have more impact over the radio, mm -hmm. you see. Whereas if you actually listen to those songs and turn them up onto a on a system to an appropriate level, so you'd have to have one track, the one that's been compressed and heavily squished, you'd have to turn that one down and match its level on the other one. They'd be at the same volume, but you'd have more dynamic range than the one that hasn't been crushed and killed, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's difficult for us to really go, we won't go too far into it, but effectively what it is, is the compression of the dynamic range uh, in any audio. And a really good example of this, actually, for anyone who's watching this, is uh, you may remember a time when TV programs uh, were a certain level of volume, and then when the adverts came on, they'd be hugely louder. So effectively, they would peak at the same level. So the, the loudest points in the TV program and the advert would be peaking at the same level. But the um, basically the, the dynamic range within the advert will be reduced to such a degree that everything is squashed up against that peak level. So it sounds louder. Um, I think that's we've got the point across. We've got the point that's across and what that, what that actually is. So, and the, there's basically side effects of this as well. You get kind of distortion, especially in the high end. Things sound kind of crunchy and crackly and crispy and basically shit. Um, <laughs> and that Death Magnetic here is a prime example of that. The guitars, the snare drum, the cymbals, just, they just sound like just nasty, just not nice to listen to. Mm. Um, it's clipping, basically. It's clipping, yeah. It's, it's, it's when, when the top of the top of your sine wave, all, all sound is a sine wave, and when it's limited and cut off and it goes into a square wave at the top, that bit where it's clipped and peaked, that's just a nasty noise, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and when you brick wall limit something, compress it that hard, it becomes like when you look at the waveform, instead of seeing a kind of moving constantly of changing different evolving um, wave line, you basically see a k -k -k stick of rock <laughs> um, and that's that's when you know it's gone wrong. Yeah, um, so what, one really interesting thing that's going on uh, in the industry, in music and uh, as well in broadcast and radio and TV, is uh, something called loudness normalization. Mm. So we effectively up until a certain point, and, and this loudness wars basically started around the 90s, some point in the 90s started to get well, it's basically worse and worse. With digital technology, really, it's it's yeah, it probably started earlier than that, really, but it's become <coughs> prevalent. And the reason the reason that that um that it actually kind of took off, and the reason for it is because people want their uh, recordings to yeah, sound to hit, louder. To sound big. They want. Yeah, they yeah. want. So if it's played on the radio in a playlist, uh, you're listening to some songs, and then suddenly, bang! There's this like really powerful sound. Distorted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it has that effect. It has that wow impact. But then, over time, listening to it, and especially listening to the whole album, it's basically fatiguing to listen to. Mm. Uh, it loses detail. It loses clarity, and more importantly, it loses dynamics. So, mm. like you listen to an old. Uh, really well produced old record like uh, Led Zeppelin's fourth album or you know and the dynamic range in that is huge it's goes mm. so soft like classical recordings as well you know you get so much dynamics and in kind of rock and pop it's just all about it's become all about impact and power and it, just getting it to sound as loud as you can yeah. having the same peak volume level yeah, through so everything gets squashed up which is squashed and distorted really distorted yeah, which is basically very unnatural really it's not mm -hmm. the way music actually sounds so uh, the really interesting kind of development in this space is something called R128 which is a new n uh, loudness normalization uh, sort of um, initiative yeah. that's being adopted across uh, all different platforms Radio, TV, and, and is predicted to actually start to be built into you know uh, mm. playback devices mm. and the difference between that and peak normalization is that with loudness normalization you take how loud the song is let's say okay basically there is a loudness calculation called RMS root mean uh, squared that's correct which is basically the average loudness of the music over time but uh, it's also kind of 
uh, altered to uh, give greater uh, sort of well, emphasis on certain frequency response. Yeah, frequency, yeah. frequencies. But essentially, in its simplest form, it's, it's more of an taking an average. Mm. It's because it, like PMPO and RMS have been used in um, amplifier ratings for years. PMPO is peak mean, peak mm -hmm. output, and that's like the highest level it puts out, even if it's for a nanosecond, um, which is a very inaccurate way of rating the output of an amplifier. Um, whereas RMS is the root mean squared, which is basically an average calculation mm -hmm. of its power. So it's Over a time. continuous thing, and this is yeah. the same sort of thing in in terms of the output of the audio recording. Mm -hmm. So, so one way to look at the new changes in in all the the audio industries. The various ones and radio okay. is is that things are going to be matched by loudness instead of peak. Mm. So effectively, you've got uh, you know a death magnetic, which sounds really loud when it's played at the same uh, you know volume level as um, you know something else like Led Zeppelin yeah. sounds way louder because it's it is. Loud. But if it's put through a system where it's analysed uh, to take an average, mm -hmm. then basically it's just going to sound bad. <laughs> well, what happens is they turn it down. Yeah. They'll turn They'll that turn down, down so that the RMS levels match. So it loses it loses the impact, and all you're left with is the the detrimental effects of it. The distortion, the distortion and lack of and dynamic range. Yeah. So basically, the transients or or the snare hits or anything that comes out is actually a you know, a, a peak hit, you know, something that should really stand out dynamically, um, that's the thing that's been compressed down. And in uh, Led Zeppelin, if you had it playing at the same RMS level, you know, normalised loudness level as this, you'd hear those transients coming through, it would sound, it would be and sound louder, they would peak at a higher level. But um, it, would, it would be the same overall level, and this is a massive change, and it is really incredibly important yeah, yeah, for important. you know for everybody. And effectively, you know, I sort of get the feeling that mastering engineers are really slow okay. on the uptake of this because it's like, well, Spotify's already normalised. Yeah. YouTube is normalising every, pretty much every playback. Uh, it's you know. been a function in iTunes for years. You can normalise your entire library. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't let iTunes do that to my library. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that the the one twenty eight thing, if they're if they're implementing, well, if they do a, a, like yeah. an industry wide standard, yeah, you know, which is what's happening basically. effectively, and it's so good for music because people have got so used to this distorted sound, like with, you know, pop, uh, all pop records. Okay, dynamic range is basically, and not to get too technical again, but dynamic range is basically the difference between the peak level which is going to be 0 db or just under 0 db and the rms level so that's the average loudness and the peak and the difference between those two is the dynamic range now an album like death magnetic has three has decibels of dynamic range 3 db which is nothing as close to pure pink noise as yeah. you you're ever going to get uh, in music and hopefully we will ever get yeah um and I think that these are the this well no we won't talk too much about this album because uh, we'll save that for later. But effectively, you know, it's it's a huge change this R128 and the loudness normalisation and uh, it's such a huge benefit for everybody because people got used to this distort. You know, when they hear mm. that and basically what happens when you limit and you compress really heavily and you clip, uh, even if it's soft clipping to a certain degree and you reduce that dynamic range, you lose impact in the music, you lose uh, you musicality. Lose, you lose ex all the expression and the dynamics in the playing. You, like, if Say if I was playing a guitar and I had a really heavy compressor in the chain and I was sort of doing something like finger picking where you, you can have so much dynamic range to really light, to really, it's basically the same level is coming out at the end because the compressor is just squishing it all. Mm, so everything. anything I'm playing loud is just being straight down yeah. to the level of the quietest things I'm playing. But there's one thing you so gain you with that. You gain distortion. You gain distortion. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah the, the, it is in terms of just guitar and guitar distortion which is you know when the first um, distortion device came out which was the Electroharmonix LPB1 which is the linear power booster it basically just times the signal by, you know, like how many magnitudes. Mm. Um, and 
that was the first time that a distortion had ever actually been been used. And it's but all distortion is is just increasing the gain again until it clips and clips and clips, and it basically just completely destroys the signal and just makes it go. <laughs> and interestingly, <laughs> with the guitar, for some really weird reason, it sounds awesome. So yeah. it's, it's really taken off. You know, it's a lot. It's just a standard sound now. But that. Used in it used is, artistically, right? Yeah, yeah. And but it, it is an effect, you know. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to do that to a two channel stereo mm -hmm. mixed. To me, a doing record that of multiple channels. To me, doing that is the opposite of mastering. Oh yeah. If you think of a mastering engineer, the worst thing they could possibly do, yeah, in my opinion, <laughs> is that. Yeah, yeah. It's just completely distort everything and make mm. and reduce the dynamic okay. range. I mean that is the worst possible thing that you can think of and, and really yeah. it's, it's something that we've gone through from the early 90s until now and now we're really heading away from it. We've got you know, chart toppers that have a dynamic range of 10 dB which is where we really need to be at and that's, or it, even even more you need to be at 12 13, dB, yeah. yeah that kind of thing and that's where you know albums that, that sound really great in the yeah, 80s to, and 90s. On your stereo you just have to turn them up a bit. Yeah and this is another thing that, that I think is worth covering that it is actually completely uh, separate from level so mm. you know you basically got when you record music and you put music out you've got a certain amount of headroom that you can you can create the music in that has nothing to do with how loud you turn the music no, up no. or down they're two different, completely separate things. So when people hear loudness wars, yeah, well, I can just turn that up, you know. Yeah, uh, no, it's, a, it's a very it's, different thing. It's very different. And effectively what it, what loudness or uh, what the current state of the loudness wars has given rise to is very distorted masters that are an industry standard. You've got band managers, you've got record labels and artists themselves saying, I want it to just kick yeah i want it as loud as everything or louder yeah, that's it I, I to be honest i don't think mastering engineers are really to blame totally i think it's something that they're when they're sending well, they their masters they're off for uh, you know mm. to be reviewed they're like no it's not loud enough you know so they, they've been mm -hmm. forced to push it by labels or artists or but people are kind of getting wise to all this now and realizing like stephen wilson from porcupine tree and his own solo stuff great British musician, done mm -hmm. awesome. everything he does is awesome. Um, well, well, pretty much. Yeah, kind of. I guess, <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's mixed a lot. He mixes most of Opeth's albums, seemingly recently. Like he, he mixed the first one he did was Blackwater Park, and then he mixed Deliverance Damnation. He's he's mixed Heritage, mm -hmm. and their most recent one, which the name escapes me now, but it's a very good album. <laughs> What's it called? I can't. I don't bloody know. I can't, I can't remember. remember. It's a really good album though. Um, <laughs> and his most recent album, I think it's got a dynamic range of about 12 or 13. That's right, that's right. And he's it doing does. it intentionally. It's like yeah. this hand cannot erase. Yeah. Stephen Wilson's third so Sounds album. great, sounds it amazing. Sounds awesome. It sounds, yeah, it sounds really, incredible. really good. I mean, that's an album. And, and the thing is that the, the effects of the Loudness Wars are really, it's kind of, in a way, for people who aren't real connoisseurs and have high quality headphones and all that kind of stuff. It's you almost like a notice if you're if you're using those white headphones you get with your iPhone, you should basically shoot yourself now. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, um, but it's not. It's not. I've got some of them. Yeah, I've got some of them. I got yeah. them with my iPod. I used them once. I my um, my lead broke on my inner monitors, and I was getting the tube to work one day, and they were the only other headphones I had, like little earbuds. And I put them in, and I started listening to something, and I literally didn't want to listen to music because it sounded so bad. Well, um, but the thing is, so many people listen on really bad quality equipment, so they. It's don't not really so. You know, it's a. It, the thing is that it's like it will be a subconscious thing. You just absorb all this distortion, and there's studies, scientific studies, that prove that that kind of distortion is actually stressful. Oh, you yeah, know that is. kind of clipping distortion repeatedly over time. It's stressful to listen to. It's not a pleasant experience. <coughs> Yeah. And you know it's it's um, it's a a very good thing. Well, it's that we're very really unnatural. It's it. a constant barrage. It's just mm. just like no no kind of let up or you know it's not it's not good. Mm -hmm. I mean you'd think it, it, with a genre like metal, which is obviously the the nature of the music is it, it has no let up and it is aggressive and powerful, but. There's a difference. It's if it still has dynamics in it, and there's kind of movement and fluctuation. 
it's you don't have that kind of issue. It's not to do with the this the kind of the distinction we're trying to make. It's not to do with the actual music and the recording that's been done. It's the um, it's it's the way the the whole thing's treated and pushed. It kind of it just makes it everything gets distorted. Yeah. 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 So I think that's it for Loudness Wars. Um, we'll probably continue talking about this a little bit when we talk about Death Magnetic. Yeah. Um, well, that's why we chose this album. So I reckon let's cut and we'll come back and talk about that. Talk about that. Talk about that. We need to open. Hello, we are back. Um, and we are going to talk about Death Magnetic by Metallica. 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 Metallica, yeah. That's how pronounced. <laughs> Alright, sorry, I didn't know that. Um, so, we obviously chose this album because it is very much, uh, goes very much hand in hand with the Loudness Wars discussion because these guys yeah, and this what, album is the, the biggest worst. victim yeah. of the Loudness Wars. This is the victim. This is the victim. Yeah. If you want to hear the results of the Loudness Wars, get this album and have a listen to it and listen to the distortion. Um, and listen to how it sounds in general compared to some other recordings, pretty much any other recording I've ever done. Um, it has a dynamic range of three decibels. Nice. Oh, yeah, <laughs> superb. Awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we're drinking Carver again today. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> we're just celebrating. I'm, I'm just throwing it everywhere. Um, so, death. Magnetic. This is what I think it's their ninth album. Yeah, I think so. Ninth album released in September 2008. Uh, it's the first album where they have uh, Robert Trujillo. 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 I don't know. Robert. Robert. <laughs> um, on the album, the, the new bass player. So obviously they, uh, Jason Newstead left the band actually before St Anger, which is the pre previous album to this one. And uh, they were going. They went through a phase of looking for a new bass player. They during, did, yeah, in that process. Dur yeah, during that time, and they uh, auditioned a number of different people, and eventually they settled on Robert Trujillo, Trujillo, <laughs> um, who used to play bass for Ozzy Osbourne. Mm. Um, and then the tour following when he joined Metallica. Jason Newstead actually went and did that tour with Ozzy, so they just kind of switched places, which is a bit bizarre. But, mm. but yeah, watch Some Kind of Monster, that was that. It's that great. was recorded at that period, yeah. It's a great rock documentary. Yeah, it's really interesting, Really good it? sweaters. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, great, yeah. Great sweaters. Cardigans. Yeah, car yeah. emotional breakdowns. It's yeah. Good. yeah. Mess that was messed up, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's what can happen. That's good. That's good. Um, so, yeah, check that out. Uh, it's the first album that's produced by someone other than Bob Rock um, for, I think, the last... Since the Black album. Since so the Black since album. Like 91? I don't even know how many... I think well, it was 91. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so, it was actually produced by Rick Rubin, who is a very well-known producer. We won't go into his credits because you can go and check out what he's done. One thing I will say about him, though, is he's very different to a lot of producers. He's a total hands-off producer. He's basically a kind of artistic. He never touches the mix mixing desk. He kind of just gives opinions and stuff. So he's, he's not a kind of techie producer. He's, he's a very different style. Interesting. But, uh, mm. And you know, the thing is that they work so well with Bob Rock. Mm. He, as we said in a previous video in our uh, vlog about Load, which we may as well Link to right now. I'm going to put an annotation here for the video where we discuss load and praise it. Um, and in that video, we basically say how the band really works very well with Bob Rock. It's almost like he's a member of the band, yeah, yeah. member of the family. And you know, you can really see that in their documentaries. And now they got uh, Rick Rubin involved. And you know, my general opinion on the writing and composition and material within the album is that it's a step above St. Anger. Oh yeah, St. Anger was a catastrophe, mm. basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it kind of makes sense, because at that time, obviously, they were going through so many problems. They you know, obviously switching out a band member, and 
Jason had been playing with them for like you know over 20 years, um, and uh, like Hetfield was going through all various different sort of problems. He was treated for Rehab, therapy. Wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they were obviously in a bad bad state at the time. So I think the reason the album's not great is probably because they weren't in a particularly great place. We will um, we will at some point discuss that album as well because I've yeah. got a lot to say about that. <laughs> I don't really want to listen to it again. Well, we're gonna have to. I'm it's sorry, because <laughs> I've got I've got some things I want to say about that album. I've got okay. to get off my chest publicly. <laughs> a rant. Yes, a rant on that album. We're gonna have a slight rant on this album. Mm. But anyway, um, most of my ranting on this album because I actually think a lot of the songs are very cool. There's some good playing on it. I think a lot of them are very good songs. I just think it's the way it, it's been, the way the audio has been handled in the final stage just destroyed it. Let's focus on the actual composition in the album first. I think that it's really a lot better than St. Anger. I think it's, it's you know, there are, there's actually some moments in it that are interesting to listen to and I like very much. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sorry to, I think you know what I think about some anger. But the thing is that at the same time there are some mediocre elements. Okay. Yeah, and now this are. album has been praised by the press and oh great they're back and, and you know etc. In my opinion, a lot of it is pretty mediocre material. Yeah, the riffs they don't really move me that much. It's just rehashing yeah. stuff and certainly there's some good stuff. Like my favourite tracks on here are uh, Broken Beat and Scarred, Cyanide. Uh, the Unforgiven Three is pretty good. Um, Judas Kiss is pretty good. Actually, because some of the kind of softer ones, and this is what's a real shame about the mastering of this, it's like the Unforgiven Three and All Nightmare Long are quite subdued um, in points. You know, they have they have these quite mellow parts, and they get lost. The the album in general, it's quite aggressive. It's very aggressive. It, yeah. it, it's, it's. I think they were trying to. Paced. I think they they obviously knew the backlash they got with Saint Anger, mm. and they they realised that you know they basically it's the first album they ever released pretty much that wasn't received well. <laughs> really, I mean it sold a lot because whenever a, a band like as huge as Metallica releases an album, everyone that knows or likes Metallica goes and buys it immediately so it goes to number one all around the world immediately mm -hmm. in every they're country. Just, they're just established it in just that happens. way. But then late afterwards you know I think that's the first time they've had the um, a real kind of uh, fan sort of bad reaction I suppose. Mm. I mean because they kind of had it a little with Load and Reload but it's mm. not it wasn't it was people just saying they didn't like it because it was different, but St. Anger was different, it was just shit, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was, it was really crap. Well, you know, the thing about it, what what I think, is that a lot of the critical acclaim that they got on this album is because it's aggressive and fast and the drumming yeah. is kind of full-on, in a way, um, for them, definitely. Uh, and to me, I think that just playing in that way doesn't actually make it heavy. And if you go and check out a vlog about what makes music heavy, which we're also going to link to in an annotation mm. right here, you'll see what we think makes music heavy. And, uh, you know, I don't think this is a particularly heavy album. It has quite a light feel to it. It's just, mm. you know, I've seen these, these reviews where they say, oh, I've been waiting for this album since Injustice for All. And I feel like, what? So you didn't like the Black Album <laughs> or Load or Reload, which in my opinion are... They're probably their three best albums, or at least. Um, and Justice for All is one of my favourite Metallica albums. It really is. I love. Yeah, it's okay. But it's it's badly mixed, but I love yeah. it. I, like it's got some great. But songs. you see what I mean? I just don't feel that huge amount of passion and drive in this album. They're old that's men. The they're this like, is, that's the problem. They should 60. retire. They're I mean, pushing come on. sixty. They, they don't have to. Know? put... I guess they should. They probably might as well put albums out because they're going to go to yeah. number one. So. Yeah, exactly. They they've released an album. That's it. Bosh, like number one in like three hundred countries or yeah. something. Yeah. Um, and then they can go and tour stadi stadiums worldwide for like two years. But yeah. <laughs> so before we talk about the the sound of the album, mm. let's just cover some technical details. So it was mixed by a guy called Greg. Fiedelman. Well, he, he didn't just make so he was the guy who actually recorded it, so he was mm -hmm. the engineer. And he, um, I've seen yep. videos from the time when they were doing this. They put a lot out on um, on their website, actually. They had little snippets they put out. 
um, every day I think they did it mm -hmm. um, and yeah it was just him basically in the studio with whoever was recording at that particular time he had sort of other engineers working with him mm -hmm. but yeah so him Fiedelman or whatever his name mm -hmm. is that I would never remember Greg Fiedelman Greg. Yeah. and it was also mixed by Andrew Sheps and I reckon that Andrew Sheps did most of the mixing Andrew Sheps in my opinion is a genius uh, uh, I'm not going to say too much more about him, but basically he, he's the man, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, another mix engineer that I I kind of um, and have a guy, lot of respect for. the guy for. who fucked it up was? Uh, well, <laughs> the mastering engineer is a guy called Ted Jensen. Yeah. Um, Ted Jensen, though, he, he's actually a done nice a segue. lot of very, very good stuff. Yeah, and he's yeah. worked on a lot of good stuff, but he's also worked on a lot of stuff that's been really crushed in the mastering mm. process, compression-wise. Uh, like American Idiot by Green Day, which still sounds pretty damn good, uh, and a number of others. Um, but um, <coughs> he said, Ted Jensen said, when he was asked about it, he said that the, the mixes that he received were actually already crushed. Mm. He said they were already very, very heavily compressed when he received them in the mastering stage. They were already very little dynamic range, and a lot of the damage had been done by the time he got them. So he was kind of you know, passing off responsibility for that and, you know, fair enough, I suppose, but who cares? Effectively, it sounds as it does. And it would have to be signed off by, you know, Rick Rubin. Um, it would Metallica. have to be signed off by Metallica. <laughs> uh, the, maybe the management, uh, the label, the mastering engineer, you well, know, I think everyone. I, so I, they're, I, they're all idiots. I, I, well, no, I think what they wanted was a massive initial impact. I really think it was... They wanted to say Metallica is still hardcore, you know. I, yeah. I really think that's a big part of it. Mm. I think they wanted it to be bigger, brasher, louder, mm. more powerful than anything mm. else that was out there. Yeah, and in a way, they probably thought, "Oh, we're really forward thinking." Yeah, probably. Because we got to the point yeah. where dynamic range is at six, and it's going in that direction. <laughs> so let's just, keep let's going. just go. Let's just go. Let's take it as far as we can. <laughs> let's have zero decibels of dynamic yeah. range. See what that. We should do a mix like that just to see what it's like. <laughs> that, zero it would decibels. Sound, well, <laughs> it would sound horrible. I've but got, a, I can I've got, we can I've do got it, no white noise and pink noise generator over there. Probably sounds very similar. Just, yeah, just use that. Um, so, you know, I, I I think the thing is that by doing that, by making that decision, and by going down that route, it sounds dreadful. The album sounds horrible. Yeah, it's it, it's basically impossible to listen to on headphones. I I found like I use in-ear monitors that we use when we play live, but I also use them when I'm just out and about listening to music, and they sound awesome. They're really, really high quality, really incredible sounding things. And I tried to listen to this album on them once, and it was literally unbearable. It was yeah. just awful. It just sounded so bad. Mm. It's just awful. But when you listen to it through a stereo, through big speakers or whatever, it kind of... It's passable, but it still sounds bad. Well, that just it's, shows that you know whatever you're listening to it on is not really showing what's what's there. You know, yeah, yeah. the higher quality devices that you listen to it on. Well, no, I think the there, there is it. there is a difference between having it directly injected into your ear canal to having it in a yeah, room, but that's what that's the doing. Room kind of absorbs some. exactly. It's it, but that's what it's doing. You know, it's basically it's showing you what's actually there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's more clinical. So I didn't listen to it on the Sennheiser HD 800. Yeah, that'd be a bad move. That I made a, a video about. That would kill it. Yeah, horrible. <laughs> <right? laughs> because they they are really high def headphones. Mm -hmm. I made a video about it, and again, we may as well link to it. Watch this video if you want to learn about Sennheiser HD 800s. Um, but basically, I listened to it on slightly lower grade, but still studio quality, uh, high def uh, headphones. Use the AKGs. Yeah. No, the uh, Audio Technica oh, okay. M50X, and I got halfway through the album and I gave up because it was just I, I could not bear it. I couldn't bear it. The sound <coughs> sounds like someone's recorded a, a snare drum and then at the same time they've synced a sample of someone scrunching, a, a, you know, like a plastic bag. <laughs> You know, well, it's, well, I, it's horrible. I sent Tom a message when we were talking about discussing this, and I said it basically sounds like someone's got a crisp packet, and they're just like crunching it in your ear, mm -hmm. and that's literally that's just going on the whole time. It's just like, 
Yeah, it's a fucking awful. It's a really and it does stress you out. It's, it's a horrible. Yeah. It's an. Experience. I, I I did get through the album, but I had to switch the speakers. Um, yeah. You know, for for I I actually really look for mixes and uh, you know music that is well recorded, well mixed, and well produced mm. and well mastered. That's a big part of you know what I what I listen for when I'm listening to music, be it whatever genre, you know. Um, and when I listened to this, immediately I felt like, what the hell? There's no, you know, the, the bass has lost all its power completely, sounds non-existent almost. The guitars sound really weird in their mid front. The drums are really awful. Whenever, whenever yeah. he does a fill on the snare, it's just it's so abrasive. But the snare all the time, the backbeat snare, yeah. the, the Lars Ulrich backbeat snare, it's ruined. And how they, these guys who are professional individuals, how the mastering engineer, Andrew uh, Sheps, how all of these guys, how they all got together and went, yep, that's good, that's what we want, perfect, when they're listening to the worst pos... What's wrong with them? I well, don't understand it. Something I heard, I've never tre checked this because I'm not a gamer, but um, the game Guitar Hero, Yeah. they used some tracks off this, I don't know which ones, I've never played Guitar Hero, um, but apparently they took, for Guitar Hero they have to take the individual stems of stuff, so they'll have guitars on their own. So this is the pre-mastering stage, and apparently the mix in Guitar Hero sounds better than this because it hasn't gone through the mastering stage, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I that's totally unsubstantiated mm. uh, from me because I've never played it or heard it, but I've heard that from quite a few people. Mm -hmm. And I know that's the that, process. No, that, I, I know that's that the process correct. they go through. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> they go. They literally go back a step so they can separate the instruments out. Yeah, they do stem, yeah. stem exports. So you're kind of losing the mastering stage, and apparently it sounds a lot better. But yeah, maybe yeah so check Chet, that, Ted Jensen, that. what the fuck? <laughs> what did you do, Ted? Um, but anyway, he did Far Beyond Driven by Pantera. That's got yeah, that's a dynamic album, heavy as hell, but dynamic. Yeah, he lost the plot though at some point. Well, this is why I said this earlier. I, I don't know. A it. lot of it's industry pressure mm. um, from labels, from from maybe Confusion. artists, just Fear. general not, stupidity. Not yeah, stupidity. Uh, retardation. Fear of reject <laughs> rejection. <laughs> yeah, just uh, lack of focus on what really matters. It's it's. I think it's a who's got the biggest dick competition. To some <laughs> it's, just, it's all gone wrong. Probably who's got the smallest dick competition, actually. Mm. And currently, <laughs> Metallica are winning. Um, but that's a bit harsh. But anyway, you know, they're geniuses, right, for the record, obviously. No, I've, I've loved fans. Metallica my entire life. Like, we're wearing Metallica t-shirts. Yeah, we're so. both wearing Metallica t-shirts. So I've got loads of Metallica t-shirts. So I've seen Metallica live, like, six times. I've been into them since I was about 12 years old. I love everything they do, apart from... Some anger. <laughs> Some anger. And this is a bit of a pain in the ass to listen to. It is. But it's still a good Such record. a shame, though, yeah, because it if is it was a shame, properly it done... Is a good, it is a good album. There's good yeah. songs. There's... Some of Kirk's playing on it's really cool. He's kind of gone back to actually mm -hmm. kind of improvising. And it's, he's kind of hit the halfway point between... Yeah, right. Yeah. Between the all-out, fully choreographed, orchestrated thrash metal solos, which mm. like, you know, note for note worked mm -hmm. out. And the stuff he kind of did on Load and Reload was a lot more laid back and bluesy. This is kind of a midpoint. He did a lot of improvisation, but yeah. in the kind of thrash style, which but is good. They definitely... Lars found his kick drum again. Um... Well, I... <laughs> <laughs> you know, full respect to, to Lars for, for the drumming on this album. I, I really yeah, yeah he's, there's some seriously good drumming on it. Yeah. It just sounds shit because I just find it so it. difficult to listen to. Mm. You know, it, it's just like someone's ruined ruined the product. But I've heard some of these songs live. I saw them at Glastonbury last year, mm. and uh, they sounded fucking good. Mm. You know, live played properly. Yeah, yeah, rocked. Yeah, and it, it's a good album. You know, actually, okay, right now I'm gonna. I'm going to lay it on the line here. I'm going to say out of 10, if the album was properly, you know, in terms of composition, mm. if it was properly done out of 10, I would give it a 6, a 5 to 6. But in its current package, <laughs> okay, I would give it a 1 to 2 because I just cannot bear it. That's my yeah, own it's, personal it's, opinion. It's a real shame. It's one of those albums 
I mean, for me, I when I listen to music, I tend to listen to albums. I don't sort of listen to individual songs. Yeah, me too. But this is one of those things that I'll literally, I just listen to a song of. Um, it's all you can bear. Yeah, which is a real, it's kind of a product of the, uh, the failure. Mm. I don't know. It's, it's, Master fail. It's a shame. Master Great fail. artwork, by the way. For God's sake, Metallica, at some point, remaster it and release, you know, a version with more dynamic range that's not, that doesn't have the issues that this album has. And by the way, it's not just us saying this. This is well renowned as the biggest loudness it's, wars it's victim. Whenever anyone talks about the loudness wars, this is the album that comes up. But this is it. This again. is the evidence. But, but, but <laughs> this but, is the evidence of the problem. Yeah, but it's again, it. you know, they're in a way groundbreaking, right? <laughs> because they did what they did with Napster. They've done this. And this signified the end of the loudness wars, really, because you're not really going to get any other albums with such a uh, small amount of dynamic range. And the industry is moving in the other direction now, so well, it's they pushed it right to as yeah. But still, a few get. years later, like Skrillex, still at the same kind of level. What my three? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. It's the, that that's the worst I've I've ever come across personally. Yeah, but I haven't. I mean, I don't know. There may be other albums. There probably are. Especially I think in it's electronic electronic music. music. I think it's probably yeah. less noticeable. Yeah, they push it further. Yeah, they can. But. Because because the instruments and the you know whatever's there right, originally, everything is yeah, it's it doesn't have so much dynamic range when you have got synths playing at a constant mm. level. So um, that's our opinion on Death Magnetic by Metallica. Uh, now let's just talk a little bit about sort of uh, band updates that we've got. Band updates. Just done a few edits on the website. Um, still awaiting delivery of the CDs, which should be here within about. A week or a week and a half from now. Hopefully, yeah. And then we should be releasing the album. Are we going to talk about the dynamic range of our album? <laughs> okay. I think yeah, we okay. So, um, we've done some analysis. Yep. Yeah. Um, obviously, it was mastered at Dugout Productions in Uppsala, Sweden by Daniel Bagstrand and his friend, who I think is a guy called George, who's effectively a, a studio yeah, assistant. Says, yeah. um, you know, uh, and we... Originally, when we went came to mastering the album, we obviously had some preferences because we know a fair amount about this topic. So we really wanted our album to be listenable and effective. Uh, an R one two eight. Having a really bad day. So we <laughs> we wanted um, <coughs> our album to have a lot of dynamic range, a la Steve Wilson. Um, and you know, so that's what we we said we effectively we wanted it to not be squashed and we didn't want to be loudness wars victims now uh the the masters that we've received of the album are what you would call industry standard loudness it's more pushed than we would have liked to mm. be honest it still sounds good there's not there's not nasty artifacts distortion yeah. artifacts it actually sounds good um, but it's definitely a harder push than we mm. would have liked. Or have so done. we have a dynamic range of six decibels, which is twice as much as that album. Mm. Um, you know, it's still it's still pretty. It's reasonable. Damn loud. It's like it's yeah, it's it's pretty loud. It's pretty. It's yeah, it's, pr it's pretty. It's pretty pushy. P pretty pushed. Pretty squashed. Yeah. But it still actually sounds decent. Yeah, it's well, it's actually better, ma definitely better mastered than that. Oh yeah, it's a lot and, better mastered than You know, that. better mastered than... Yeah. It, it. The thing is that I think a, a certain amount of it is just the fact that we have so much that doesn't have a huge amount of dynamic variation. We have a lot of distorted guitar mm. and, and inevitably you're going to end up with a limited dynamic range yeah. anyway. It's basically, is it the same as Californication by Chili Peppers? Yeah, same dynamic yeah, ranges. Same dynamic range as that. Yeah. Although our music starts out heavier, so in a way they've lost more dynamics than we have. Mm. Yes, that makes that sense. That makes sense. It does. So, yeah, it sounds very, very good. Um, but I would have preferred it to be a little bit less than that, maybe like eight or nine. Ten, maybe. But you know, we're going to, for, for our next release, we're going to push for a. We're actually moving in the opposite direction. Mm. We've got targets we're, in the opposite yeah, direction. Yeah, we're getting quieter. Yeah, we're trying to, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, I'd be interested to know what Telos is. 
It's probably quite a lot. It's probably about thirteen or something. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this evening. Uh, in fact, let's put a little annotation here of what the dynamic range of Telos original and 2013 remaster is right here. So now you know. Um, but I'll tell you That'll later. Take a while to yeah. Work that out. Uh, oh, I can do that pretty quick. <coughs> so um, yeah, I mean, what else do we have for band updates? We are. We've up made some major updates to our website, which is looking great. Mm -hmm. A new website. We are kind of actively preparing now, for the launch of the. We're album. now hosting all our YouTube videos on our website as well, so you can always go over there to watch them. Uh, we've got various. There's like a vlog section, a Telos Logacharia, um, a mm. live section. So all our YouTube videos will be within the website, so you can always go there to check them out and. It's had a few little tweaks, there's nothing major really, just a few little tweaks and bits and bobs and the there's a whole other section for La Gacharia which isn't um, available to you, for you to see yet but it's all that's all now done um, so when we when we release the album there's going to be a, a whole load of information, loads of photographs while we're recording um, all the lyrics those of other bits and bobs, image, all the artwork. Really, we're really proud of the website. We're really happy with it. It's mm. a hell of a lot of work to do that. A lot of work. A hell of a lot of work to do that. Um, <laughs> and you know, and effectively, it's exactly what we, what I envisioned, but couldn't actually create. <laughs> create. So yeah, no, thanks say. for doing that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you're very lucky though. I obviously have a similar mind to you, then, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I gave you some fake instructions. <laughs> yeah, we need a website. Yeah, it has a to website. be good. It has to be good. Really good website, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, bye. <laughs> See you in six months. Mm. Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're really looking forward to the CDs arriving and putting them on sale. Album launch is going to be on the 15th of May. Uh, we've got now, actually, massive news, which we didn't mention. What's that? We have... The album sampler live. Oh yeah, <laughs> three free tracks. It's just been out for three days, so I'd kind of forgotten about it. Yeah, three uh, three tracks. The first three tracks from the album. You can download them for free from our website in MP3 format. Um, We're going to put yeah, a link in the description cool. to that album sampler. Yeah, so you can go and go and grab that for free. For free, yeah. Um, yeah, there's going to be another music video to follow the Logos music video of a track called Gaia which is the third track on the album, which is mm -hmm. also in this sampler. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that will be out in June, but it's I'm basically in a big world of editing hell at the moment, editing it together, because it's a much more complex, artistic kind of video than the Logos one, which was just you know us playing in the studio while we were, while we were tracking, so it was a much simpler video. Mm -hmm. This one's a bit more involved, so we're hoping to have it by the 1st of June. That's the aim. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. Uh, equally, at the same time, I'm kind of uh, I'm working on the uh, press releases and sending things to press contacts and bloggers and reviewers. Um, we actually came across, and I want to give a shout out to. Let's do both of them. Let's do both of the guys that we've been talking to. Yeah, well, there's there's Wooter, who's uh, has a radio show from Holland but it's actually um, it's broadcast in New Jersey in the States called The Dutch Treat which is a, a show about European prog bands basically mm -hmm. um, so he's going to be playing a few of our tracks I can't remember the dates now we'll say this in another blog because it's, it's a way away yeah it's in June but he's going to be he's, we're going to be his band of the week f mm -hmm. in June I think it's the 2nd and the 10th or something that's cool it's been, but it's it's broadcast from New, out of New Jersey, and it's it's broadcast online as well. So, so we actually have kind of a unique approach to the way that we work. <laughs> You're right, there. Go on, go on. <laughs> the way the way that we work with with press as well, which is we we really want to engage people who we care about, who who, who actually mean something to us. So you know, well, people for instance, give a shit, you know? well, people who who do something that we respect. Um, Wooter's a good example. For, bo for both of these, we'll put links in the description to their pages and their blogs. Uh, a guy I've been talking to is a guy called Matt Spall, and he runs a blog called Man of Much Metal. Or I think it's yeah, actually a blog he writes, of Much Metal. 
And he writes for um, Powerplay magazine. Yep. Mm. And his blog posts and his album reviews are brilliant. They re they're really amazing. I found a couple of new bands. Um, highly recommend anybody um, to go and, you know, if you're watching this, interested in what we do, check out what he's doing because, you know, yeah. he's writing some really, really great stuff, putting material out there. Yeah, he's a guy that's really into the scene, really into metal and, you know, really very passionate. Both mm -hmm. the guys we're talking about, Wooter and um, mm -hmm. and him, they're kind they're of like-minded, but just doing it in a different, you know, like I. Well, yeah, they're really passionate about. They're not musicians, but they're in the industry and passionate about about the music and about you know. So instead of doing <laughs> instead of doing mass send outs to press, that's what what we prefer to do, which is really find the outlets and the people that we think are high quality instead of just here's a load of spam you know, that you can copy and paste and put on your blog or whatever. We're, we're much more about finding people who, whose opinions we respect and, um, and having them. So it is quality over quantity. Mm. So go check out the description for links to their uh, sites and uh, Matt's blog. And I think that is it for mm. today. That's it. Number 10. Number 10. <laughs> Number 10 done. Yeah. Um, so thanks for watching. Actually, thanks very much for watching, and if you're not subscribed, subscribe to the channel, um, and there'll be another video in about a week's time from now. I will, yeah. We're going to start doing a lot more gear review, well, not reviews, but gear-related and equipment and techie kind of stuff, because me and Tom are both utter gear junkie tech heads. Geeks. Yeah, total geeks. <laughs> um, so, we know a lot about all this kind of music tech stuff so we're going to start putting out a lot more videos that are geared around specific products or geared around gear geared around gear yeah gear <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right geared so again. this is Isris with a table covered in carver and we will see you in a week thanks for watching bye